Well, God's grace, his mercy, and his peace be to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my lips, and I pray that the meditation of all of our hearts be good and pleasing in your sight, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people say... Amen. Amen. Well, today we are continuing our sermon series on hope, um, our sermons and connect group Bible study series that we're doing on hope. Last week, Pastor Mike got us kick-started with our kickoff Sunday and, and regatta and everything and all the fun that we had last week. And um, he talked a lot about our God as a God of second chances. And for those who have met with your connect groups already, that was our first topic. We talked about God being a God of second chances and how, you know, he, he gives gives us second chances in lives, in our lives, and, you know, and, and how that brings us hope. And then today, we're going to talk about the next point, about how we, we find hope in our, in our God, because we know that our God hears our prayers, and we know that our God, hear, God hears our cares. And so we're going to talk all about prayer today. If you got your Bibles, you can open them up to Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 5. And the story we're going to look at is when Jesus um, talks to his disciples about what prayer is. And so um, the story is John the Baptist, you know, told his disciples about what prayer was, and, and um, you know, and, and his, Jesus' disciples come up to him and say, Lord, teach us about prayer, because John's disciples taught him about, taught them about prayer, and so Jesus teaches them about prayer. So we're going to walk through through uh, the book of Matthew chapter 6 here today. And, uh, you know, did you know that if you Googled how to pray into Google, the search engine, you'll get over 30 million 300,000 results. That's a lot of gurus, pastors, and people who are either asking about prayer or who are telling people how to pray. You know, and, and when you look at all cultures, all religions, all religions, all cultures want to connect with God, want to connect with the Almighty, want to connect with the universe, whatever terminology you use. Every, every religion, every culture has some ways that they want to connect with something bigger than themselves. And so, you know, we're going to look at what that looks like today in, you know, as Christians. And so we're going to talk today about misconceptions that we often may have about prayer in our own lives. Lives. And so maybe you've, you've had some of these misconceptions. Maybe, you know, when you've talked about prayer to other people, maybe you've told people about these misconceptions or these, you know, struggles that you've had. The first one is, I don't pray very well. I don't pray very well. Maybe I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever felt that way, you know. But one of the jokes that we have is, you know, as pastors is if there's like a bunch of Christians in a room and, you know, they're all talking and mingling, one of the best ways to get their attention, do you know how to get, you know how to get the attention of a bunch of Christians who are all talking and mingling and, you know, you want them to stop talking? You say the next person to talk gets to pray. Well, Everyone, everyone clams up real quick, you know. No one wants to be that person who, who has to pray, you know. Well, why is that? Because most of us are afraid pr of praying in public. Most of us don't feel like we pray very well. We're self-conscious about how we pray. And so it's the reason why when Pastor Mike and I are at any party, you know, the person's like, hey, Pastor, you want to lead us in prayer today? You know, because uh, we're, we're the guys who get paid to do it, right? We're going to see what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, when his disciples ask him about prayer. Here's what he says. He says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. Here Jesus is talking to people who like to be, like to show off, like to, like to be showy with their prayers. And, you know, those people who, you know, are out there and, and they're kind of doing it so that other people will see them, you know. And it, it's interesting as I was reading this this week, I never noticed what Jesus says there at the very end, you know. But what does he say? He says, truly I say, they have received their reward. What's their reward? Well, their reward is they're looking to be, to be flattered. They're looking to have other people impressed by them. They're looking for people to say, man, he's such a good pre preacher. He's such a good prayer. He's, he's so wise. He's so smart. He's so educated. You know, they're looking for men and women and other people to flatter them. They're the, the influencers, if you will, of their day. And so they're looking for the flattery of other people. And it's sad that Jesus says for them, those who are showing off 
in front of others to get the approval and the attention of others, obviously they're not, they're, they're more concerned about that than they are about God. And so he says they've received their reward, not they will receive their reward. I remember when I was on my internship as a pastor, um, to be a pastor out in Gilbert, you know, about 17 years ago, and, and I was out there, and, and we had some guest pastors come in. I just remember this story. I hadn't told this story in, a, in several years, and, and just jogged my memory as I was working on this message in this point. And um, I was remembering, you know, this, this guest pastor came in to preach at my church that I was at. And he was, uh, he was one of my high school or one of my, when I was a kid, he was a summer camp counselor at the summer camp that I was a a, a camper at. And so we were catching up after lunch. He's like, oh man, you're going to be a pastor. That's awesome. That's so great. I'm so excited for you. He's like, what's your favorite part of your internship? And I told him, you know, what my favorite part of my internship was. And he's like, what's your least favorite part of your internship? And I said, I don't like praying in front of the church. And he stopped. He's like, why? Why not? I said, well, because I've been a youth leader for the last six or seven years. I've been, you know, doing youth ministry, and all of my prayers in youth ministry are, Lord, we're going to have this pizza party, so bless our pizza tonight, you know? Or, Lord, we're going to go on our ski trip, so make sure Johnny doesn't break his ankle today, you know? Or, or Lord, we're, you know, we got this thing going on, you know, make sure, help, help, uh, help Susie get a boyfriend, or, you know, those kinds of prayers, you know, we're praying for these, the kids and the, the direct prayers prayers that the kids are offering up in our, in our um, youth ministry circle. And so I'd come in front of the church and behind the altar, and I felt intimidated. I felt like all these adults are looking at me and like I have to pray a certain way in order to like, you know, be adultish. And, and it was the weirdest thing. And I, I just, I had a hard time with it when I was on my internship. And he said something that, that changed my life in that moment. And, and, you know, and he said, he just, he cut me off. He said, I want to challenge you not to compare yourself with anyone else. He said, I want to challenge you not to compare yourself with anyone else. Each of us prays a certain way. We, it's like a fingerprint. You know, each of us has a fingerprint and, you know, we get fingerprinted so the FBI can track us if we do something wrong, you know, and because everyone's fingerprint is different. And each of us, the way we talk to God is different. You know, for those of you guys who have kids, you know, you have, maybe you have a couple of kids, a couple of grandkids, your relationship with each of those kids, those grandkids is different. You talk to them differently. You know that you can talk to one in one way. You talk to another in another way. Maybe you have a nickname or a pet name for one that you don't have for another, and it's special. And that's the way that God looks at us and the way that we talk to God is special in the same way that we talk to our kids or our grandkids. Each one's just a little bit different. So he challenged me, and I want to challenge you today. If, if you think, I don't pray very well, I'm going to challenge you to own and be thankful and be proud of however God made you and however it is you pray. Even if your prayers are, Lord, help Johnny get a girlfriend, you know, or help bless our pizza for our, for our dinner tonight, and that's it. You don't have a bunch of, you know, 10 cent theological words. You know what? That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that goes to our next point, which is number two. The second point is, you know, some people struggle with, if I just say the right things, you know, have you ever felt like you need to say the right words in the right way at the right time in order to make sure that God answers your prayers with a yes? You know, there's a whole cottage industry right now. You, you can buy books, Christian books on prayer. You can listen to Christian podcasts or YouTube videos. Or again, influencers will teach you about prayer. And when you read and, and listen to a lot of people talk about prayer today, it's very self-helpish. It's very like, let me give you seven steps to get God to answer your prayer with a yes. I've heard people say that, you know, if you want God to answer your prayer with a yes, you have to pray with authority. You have to be really specific and you got to write down everything that you want down to the color of the car or the, or the color of the house that you're asking for or the color of the, the hair of the person that you want to marry. You know, you got to, you know, give God a timeline. I need to do this by, Lord, I want you to give it to me by September 1st, you know, because you got to give God time because apparently God needs a timeline, you know, because he's a procrastinator or something. I don't know. Um, you know, you, you know, you got to tell him exactly what you want because he doesn't know anyway, you know, and, and you, and then the other one is you got to tell him every day. You got to pray every single day at the same time or else it won't come true. It's, it's interesting what Jesus says about that. 
In the next verse, Matthew 6, 7, he says this, when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. You see, when Jesus says, don't pray like the Gentiles do, what he's telling us is we shouldn't treat prayer like a magic spell. That's what the Gentiles were doing in those days. If you, if you think about ancient Greece, if you've ever traveled over, the, you know, over to the Mediterranean, you've ever been to Greece or Rome or whatever, you've seen, you know, they have temples all over the place. You know, there's all these different temples everywhere. That's because the ancient world, people were very religious in a religious generic sense. They had gods all over the place. And what they would do is they go into these various temples, they go into these various places, and the way that they would pray or the way that they would talk to God and ask God for what they wanted was they would do incantations. They would, you know, say, recite certain spells, if you will, to get God to do that. I mean, the, the Wiccan world still does those kinds of things. You know, the, the natural, the nature, nature religion still do those sorts of things. Or you'd go into a, into a place and you do a rain dance, you know, you do a little rain dance. So you bring rain on your crops or, you know, some people would go into these places and they cut themselves. You know, if you cut yourself enough times and you had enough blood flowing, it told the gods that you were really serious about what it was you wanted because you're willing to cut yourself and bring pain on yourself. So God's going to listen and he's going to give you that thing that you're asking for. Or you bring a sacrifice to him and you sacrifice something. In fact, in the ancient world, the god Molech, he, he wanted us to sacrifice our own children. You know, he wanted people to bring their children and sacrifice them to him. Because if you'd sacrifice your child on the altar for Molech, it showed that you really wanted whatever it was that you were asking for. And so Jesus is saying, you can't manipulate God. You can't do these things to show God how much you want him to, to answer your prayer. You, you, he's not a genie. It's not a magic spell. But what does Jesus say? He tells us to talk to God like kids talking to their dad. You know, all you dads out here, you know what it's like. You got your kids and you want to do everything for them. Moms, you're the same way, you know. You want to do everything for your kids. You want, to, you want to bless your kids. You want to give to your kids whatever they need and whatever they want. And, you know, and you, want to, you, you know what your kids need most of the time before they even come and ask you. And that's what Jesus is saying. God, your Father, knows what you need. You don't need to prove to him that what you're asking for or what you want is, 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 is important enough. You, you just got to go talk to him. Just got to ask him. In fact, one of the best prayers I've ever heard was one of the simplest. I heard one of our prayer warriors at our church in Houston. And she just, you know, someone gave her a prayer request. She said, Lord, you know better than I do what this person needs. So we pray, we're putting it in your hands. You take care of it. Amen. I mean, God knows. He knows about the cancer or about the illness that the person that I'm praying for has. He knows about their, their bones and their molecules and all the stuff in their body. He knows about their financial issues. He knows about their marriage struggles. I don't need to tell him about it. Because here's the thing. You know, prayer isn't about what we do. It's not about how well you pray, what words you use, how, how often you do it and show God how serious you are. Prayer's all about trusting God with your needs. That's really what it is. That's, it, that's what it is when it comes down to it. But here's the question for, for many of us. What if I don't think I'm worthy to talk to God about my needs? That's the third one. You know, I can't talk to God because I'm not good enough. You know, some people... They struggle. We struggle with this idea that, you know, maybe I'm not good enough to go talk to God. You know, I'm, I'm not able to. I had a neighbor growing up in, in California who, um, this neighbor, his name was Bob. And, you know, he lived across the street from us. And my dad would, we'd go over and watch the Super Bowl at his house. And we'd go hang out at his house sometimes. And, you know, and um, my dad would invite him to church. He'd be like, hey, Bob, you should come to church. We're doing a concert or we're doing this or we're doing that. And, and Bob would be like, Pastor, you know, you don't want me to come to church. You know, the, the, the church might get struck by lightning and burned down. You don't want me to do that. <laughs> you know, Bob, Bob thought that his past and the things he'd done disqualified him from talking to God. And just this week, I went and visited someone uh, in their home. I visited a, 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 a shut-in. And when I visited this person, as I was on my way out, this person's caregiver was on their way in. And the person, you know, shook my hand. And the, the person I was visiting said, hey, I want to introduce you. This is Pastor Tim. 
and as I shook the person, the caregiver's hand, the caregiver's like, oh, oh, you, you might not want to do that. You know, your, your hand might melt. I, I said, really? And they said, yeah, you know, I've, I've done stuff. Okay. You know, this person felt that she was unworthy to come before the presence of God. You know, she felt like she was too far gone, too unlovable. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 14. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. And if you don't forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive yours. You see, forgiveness is huge in our world. We don't talk about it. You know, it's not one of the things that gets talked about very often in our culture, but forgiveness is powerful. That's why a few minutes ago we had a confession and absolution here in, front, in church, because we got to get that stuff out so it doesn't build up. When, when we don't get stuff out, it puts up a wall between us and others and between us and God. Think of, think of your spouse or your friends or your coworkers. If, you know, you think someone's mad at you, what do you generally tend to do? <laughs> if you're like me, you're like, I'm going to keep my distance, you know. Maybe I'll hang out in the other room. Maybe I'll, you know, go, I won't go by your office door. I'll take another longer way to go to the water cooler, you know, take another hallway. You know, I don't really want to cross paths with people who are really ticked off at me, who are really mad at me, who are upset with me, you know, or that I'm upset with. I'm not, if I'm mad at someone else, I don't want to really want to be walking past their office and seeing them or, you know, same thing with when you're at home. It, it just, you, everyone's walking on eggshells. Everyone's kind of avoiding each other. When you're, when there's unforgiveness in a relationship, it builds up walls and it builds up distance. And it's the same way with our prayer life. Unforgiveness hinders our prayers. There, there was a time in my own life where I felt like I was too unforgivable for God. I felt like I was too bad of a person, too unlovable. Like the things I, I did were, were too far gone, you know? Like God for, can forgive alcoholics. He can, can forgive addicts. He can forgive all these other people, but he can't forgive me. You know, he couldn't forgive me. I'm a lost cause is what I told people. And so you know what I didn't do? I didn't pray. I didn't go to God in prayer. I maybe do a devotion, but I was kind of scratching the surface, checking the box, but I really didn't draw close to God because I was afraid that he was going to reject me. I was afraid he was going to turn his back on me. I was afraid, you know, so I, I kept my distance because I felt like he was going to keep his. Or the other thing is, you know, if I did pray and I didn't get what I asked for, you know what I thought? I thought, well, God obviously is mad at me. <laughs> He's obviously keeping his distance. He's giving me the silent treatment. Or I wasn't good enough because if I was good enough, then he would have given me what I wanted. Then he would have answered my prayer with a yes. So since I didn't get what I wanted, I obviously, you know, it's because God's mad at me and he's punishing me for it. 1 John 1 verse 9 says this. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, God wants you to know it's not about what you've done. It's not about you being worthy. It's not about you being good enough or you know, lovable enough or worthy to come into his presence. Because here's the problem. If it is about me on my own being worthy to come into God's presence, being lovable enough and good enough to come to God's presence, I'm not. I'm not. The guy in front of you is not worthy to come into God's presence based on his own merit and the things that he's done. But because of Jesus, I am. It's the fact that he chose me and he forgives me and he loves me like a father loves his child. John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you, God says. God chose you. He forgives you. And he loves you. The fourth and the last point that we see here today is, you know, misconception in prayers. I need it and I'm afraid I won't get it. You know, anyone ever felt like that? You're like, I got stuff I need in my life and I'm afraid that if I talk to God, he might say no. <laughs> or if I talk to God about it, he might tell me to wait. And I don't really want to wait. I need it now. I got to get this taken care of now. So I'm just going to like bypass God and, you know, go and do this and do this thing. And then I'll go, you know, what's that statement? It's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. 
permission, right? You know, I know some of you in this room, you, you live by that credo, right? <laughs> Maybe wives are like, yeah, that's my husband, you know? Uh, it, you know, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission. Well, some of us live that with, our, with God. You know, it's like, I'm just gonna go and get it and then I'll ask God for forgiveness later. I'll, I'll ask him to bless what I've already done. Here's what Matthew 6, 19 says. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. See, God wants everything. He wants to know about everything. Like, God wants you to tell him all the stuff you want, you know, from the, from the silly, you know, like, you know, or from the big, you know, he wants you to tell him about, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, cancer. I'm concerned about my friend's divorce. I'm concerned about all the big stuff in life. He wants to know everything from cancer to your prayers that the Cardinals win the Super Bowl. You know, he, he wants it all. But most of all, he wants you to trust him to provide. You know, as we bring those things to him, as we say, Lord, I want a Lamborghini. Lord, I want a big house on Camelback Mountain. Lord, I want this. I want that. You know, he wants us to think about as we're praying and say, I want these things. I want these things. I want these things. And as he says, yes, no, wait, he wants to challenge us to grow. And in those moments when we're not getting the things we want in the time we want, when we do get the things that we want, he wants to challenge us to see what he's doing behind the scenes. He wants to challenge us again, like a father, to trust that he knows what he's doing. Just like we ask our kids and our grandkids to trust us and say, hey, trust me, trust me, I got this. I I got your back, I'll I'll take care of this, you know, in my time, in the time it needs to be taken care of, you know, and he wants us to trust him as we go through those difficult things. You know, God wants us to have what we want, but most of all, God wants to have our hearts. In the next verse, it goes on, and Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink. Don't be anxious about your body, what you'll put on. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. He goes on and says, For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. We look at our world and, you know, the the non-Christian world, even Christians, but the non-Christian world, you know, they seek after, you know, I want, I want, you know, the new Nikes. I want the fancy car. I want the big house. I want the, the, the nice clothes, the $4,000 suits. I want this. I want the good looking girl, the good looking guy. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Back to that first point. Man, a lot of times it's, I want it so that I look good for other people. So I'll, other people will be flattered. Uh, I'll be flattered by other people because they'll think good things about me. And Jesus says, he says, a lot of those people, they seek after these things and they don't get God's kingdom. They don't get heaven. They don't get the blessings of God's kingdom here on earth. They don't get peace that passes all understanding. They don't get those things that he gives us here, but they get some of these things that they want over here. Not all of them, but some of them. And they stress and they worry and they're afraid and they're terrified and they you know, lie, cheat, steal to get it, all that kind of stuff. But what does he say we should do? He says, seek first my kingdom. Seek me. Seek my righteousness. Seek to be close to me. And guess what? When you seek me for the sake of seeking me, I'll give you all this stuff too. You can either seek this stuff and not get me, or you can seek me and I'll give you the stuff you need and want. You know, the world has a transactional quip pro quo view of God, but for us, it's relational. The world sees God as a judge or a vending machine or a genie. You know, he's scary. He's far away. He gives you what you want if you're good. He's like Santa Claus, but for us, God is close. He's a father who loves us. How do we know that God wants the best for us? Well, we look to the cross because there, John three sixteen says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. When I don't think I'm good enough to come to God, I look to the cross. When I don't think I can trust God's going to give me what I need, I look to the cross because he gave me what I needed there and even when I didn't ask for it. When I don't think I am you know, have the right words or I want to manipulate God, God says, I did something crazy that you would never have asked me for on the cross. And the cross answers all those questions of prayer. Because here's the basic question of prayer that we all come to it with. What am I afraid of? And who do I trust to take away that fear? What am I afraid of today? And who do I trust to take away that fear? Do I trust myself? Do I trust my boss? Do I trust my paycheck? Do I trust the bank? Do I trust the government? Do I trust my spouse? Or do I trust God? I'm afraid of life. I'm afraid of cancer. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of, I'm afraid of, I'm afraid of. Who do I trust to answer those fears? Prayer isn't a question about what do I get, but who do I trust? So here's the solution. Here's the solution for all of us as we pray. And maybe you've heard it. it Jesus says these words as he closes out. And this will we'll close out our message here today. He says these words. He says, instead pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that the peace which passes all understanding would keep and guard all of our hearts and our minds in Jesus today. I pray that you watch over us. I pray that you take care of us. I pray that you bless us. I pray that as we, as we go forward today, that we grow in our trust in you and our prayer lives as we seek you each and every day. Um, Lord, just remind us that you are our heavenly father who loves us dearly. You make us worthy to come to you. You love to hear from your kids as we talk to you. And Lord, we just thank you for how you answer our prayers and how you lead us and guide us each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. amen. At this time, we'll go ahead and receive our offerings. And if you haven't done so, please go ahead and take a moment to fill out the communication card.